Uh, thanks, Greg. It'd uh, be great if you keep your Bibles open, and, uh, and given the heat and the humidity today, you might want to keep using your service sheets to just keep yourselves a little bit cool. Uh, many of us here today will know personally how, her, how words can either help you or harm you. Uh, I'm sure many of us here this morning will know of times where you have been helped or you have been harmed by the words of other people. Or you can remember those times when you have used your words either to help or to harm somebody else. We, we know from experience how our words can make a very real difference in the lives of other people. And then, of course, there are those moments in history where words have been able to capture the imagination and the support of many people. Like Winston Churchill's speech in the dark days of 1940 uh, that strengthened the resolve of the British people. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Or Martin Luther King's address at the Lincoln Memorial in 1963 when he said, I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the colour of their skin but by the content of their character. They were great speeches, weren't they? I tried to find some modern day speeches that are memorable, but it doesn't seem like anyone's giving them these days. I have to go back to the 1960s and back to the 1940s to find some famous memorable speeches. Now, the passage that we've had read for us today from Luke's Gospel actually puts a spotlight on Jesus' words. Despite the fact that we hear lots of healing in this passage, it's actually all about Jesus' words, the power of Jesus' words and the priority of Jesus' words. And I think it is Luke's purpose in telling us this because he wants us to grow in our own confidence in the power and the authority of Jesus' words. Now, before we actually look at our passage this morning, it's actually probably helpful for us to uh, recall the lead-up to Jesus' ministry here in Capernaum. Because you see, in Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 30, we see uh, Jesus speaking at the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth. And at that time when he was preaching in his hometown of Nazareth, he quotes from Isaiah 61, where he de basically declares himself to be the Lord's anointed who will announce salvation to those who are experiencing God's judgment. These verses that we find in, um, in chapter 4 is his manifesto. It's setting out his agenda for his ministry. And the synagogue crowd at Nazareth, they were really impressed with what Jesus had to say. But they did recognise Jesus as Joseph's son. In fact, they asked the question, isn't this Joseph's son? And Jesus anticipates their demand to prove himself because they know him as Joseph's son. And so Jesus warns them against the repeating the bad old days of Israel's history. In the days of the prophets Elijah and Elisha, where Israel's hearts were hardened towards God's word. And those were the days when there were a few non-Israelites, a few Gentiles, who actually enjoyed the blessing of God. Now, when the local crowd heard this at Nazareth, they were infuriated with Jesus. They no longer wanted him to prove his claim, they wanted him dead and they were ready to throw him off a cliff. This is Jesus' first sermon that he ever gave. Not very well received, is it? And you'd think that this would be a good time to sort of beat a hasty retreat. Maybe it's time for Jesus to rethink his strategy about this mission. I mean, why would you continue to do the same thing and expect a different result? But no. Jesus makes his way to the town of Capernaum in Galilee. Jesus has not been undone by his rejection at Nazareth. Jesus doesn't give up 
just because he's experienced some uh, lack of success in, 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 uh, in uh, Nazareth. Instead, what he does is he teaches again on the Sabbath. And it's here in this passage today, I actually think we get the answer to the question that they were asking Nazareth. Remember the question they were asking, isn't this Joseph's son? We're going to actually find out what the answer to that question is in this passage. But the answer is going to come from the most unlikely sources. So let's have a look at our passage. It brings us to our first point, and that is the power of Jesus' words. Now, uh, what we read in verses 31 to 41 is one day in the life of Jesus, okay? Uh, it's a huge day. He's very busy this day. And in this, on this day, we're given four snapshots of the power of Jesus' words. Have a look at verses 31 and 32. And then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath, he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. Now, assume that Jesus is in a synagogue on the Sabbath, as he was in Nazareth. And here we learn that Jesus' words, his teaching, is not in the same league as the teachers of his day. Because he wasn't simply passing on the traditions and the insights from old rabbis of the past. Not Jesus, no. He speaks with his own authority. And it was so compelling that those gathered around were astonished. And to this day, 2,000 years on from this event, people from many different times and different cultures continue to be amazed at Jesus' words. And while Jesus is teaching with such authority in the synagogue, suddenly there is this sort of awkward outburst from one of those gathered there to hear him. And this is our second snapshot of this day. Uh, it is a snapshot of the first public miracle recorded in Luke's Gospel. Have a look at verses 33 and 34. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And here we have a man whose life is in the grip of pure evil. And he challenges the authority of Jesus. But this man also offers us an, an insight into Jesus' identity. He describes Jesus as both Jesus of Nazareth, which is true, but he's also the Holy One of God. But did you notice that this true knowledge of Jesus is not accompanied with faith? See, it's possible to have a true knowledge of Jesus and yet not to be accompanied with faith at all. Then look at what it says there in verses 35 to 37. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly, come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them and all at, down them all and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, what words are these? With authority and power, he gives order, orders to impure spirits and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. So here, Jesus simply rebukes the demon and the man is completely restored by Jesus' word. There's no magical incantation, there's no potions or anything done here. It's just simply Jesus speaking. And what is done here is not lost on the crowd. Look at what it is that grabs the crowd's attention. It's not the healing as much. Look at what it says there in verse 36. What words are these? With authority and power, he gives order, orders to impure spirits and they come out. These people have witnessed the authority and the power of Jesus' words. And so news about Jesus spreads through the surrounding areas. But the day is not over for, uh, for Jesus. Jesus then goes to the home of Simon, uh, that we know as Peter. And, and there, in Simon's home, is his mother-in-law, Simon's mother-in-law, and she's suffering from a, what is described as a high fever. 
Now, given Luke's background as a doctor, it seems to me that Luke is complete, completely understands the difference between demon possession and sickness. Okay? He recognises these to, uh, to be two different things. And in the first century, without the benefit of modern science, a high fever, you know, there's no Panadol back in those days, a high fever would have been regarded as a severe threat to human life. And again, Jesus demonstrates the power of his word as he just simply rebukes the fever. And her healing is so complete that she requires no bed rest. Okay, you know, after you've been sick, you feel like you need to take a, you know, a, a couple of days out just to sort of recover. No bed rest required for her. She regains all of her strength and she's back to her daily work. The final snapshot that we have in this day in the life of Jesus is there in verses 40 to 41. It's sunset. And people from the surrounding areas have heard about the authority and the power of Jesus' words. And so they are bringing to him their sick family and friends to Simon's house with the eager expectation that Jesus' words can change their lives as well. And as Jesus sets about healing them, uh, we see demons continuing to be cast out of people, shouting, you are the son of God. Here we have the identity of Jesus being proclaimed clearly. Through this passage, we're told that people were amazed but it's, at Jesus' words, but it's actually the demons who realise who they're dealing with. But now is, the not, now is not the time for Jesus to openly declare that he is the son of God. But what is important to realise about these miracles is that these aren't random acts of power. These are like real-life examples of Jesus' divine mission that he outlined in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. In those verses, Jesus stresses three times that he has been sent into the world as a preacher, that he came into the world to proclaim good news to the poor, that he came to proclaim freedom for the prisoner and that he came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. That's how he describes his mission, his manifesto, if you like. And here in Capernaum, Jesus is confronted with two of humanity's greatest enemies, disease and the devil himself. And Jesus sets about freeing people from their malignant grip with his powerful word. And I think what we have pictured here in Capernaum is a foretaste of what Jesus will bring when he finally returns. When he will deal with all illness and disease, it will be no more and the defeat of Satan will be complete. Now, decades ago, and this has happened in our lifetime for many of us here this morning, our, our culture has undergone a change where truth is, has been increasingly seen as a subjective notion. What I mean by that is people say, you have your truth and I have my truth. Okay, It's, it's subjective, it's not objective anymore. And, and we now live in what has been described as a post-truth age, where people's emotions, like being offended is far more influential in shaping public policy than objective facts are. And our culture, I think, is now reaping the whirlwind of that change as it now scrambles for words that can be trusted. Because today we live in a world where people will dismiss words as fake news or alternative facts. These are words that we hear now. They have even been uttered by one of the most powerful men in the world. But it seems to me that as we have Luke's gospel here, he writes this account of Jesus' life and ministry. He wants us to trust Jesus' words. That Jesus' words will accomplish his mission. He speaks and God works. His words might, all, might not always be well received in the same way that they weren't well received in his hometown of Nazareth. But Jesus' word has had a huge impact in the town of Capernaum. And I think we need to be reminded that the words of Jesus are still powerful to save. Because, you know, I think there's a temptation for every church in every age 
to sort of give up on God's word, to think it really, it really can't do that much. It doesn't seem to achieve very much. And so churches can be, then be tempted to find other ways. What can we do instead of focusing on God's word? And some churches have thought, well, some might think, well, if only we had some well-reasoned arguments that could advocate the Christian faith in the public square. If we can get on the ABC's The Drum or Q&A or, you know, get, get some interviews and, and have our opportunity to speak in the public square. If we have those sort of opportunities with well-reasoned arguments, that will win people over to us. But, you know, Jesus reasoned with people of his day and they didn't believe some will think if only we had gifted and able preachers today who could preach God's word powerfully, if we only had a new Billy Graham from the 1950s and 60s, then that would win people over. But Jesus himself was a great preacher and they put him to death. Some will think, if I have a spiritual experience of a personal encounter with God, if we can somehow make that happen in people's lives, then that will win them over. But, you know, in the first century, people met the Son of God. It doesn't get it much personal than that, more personal than that, does it? A personal encounter with God. And yet it didn't necessarily produce repentance and faith. Some will think our good deeds, the more good works that we involve ourselves in as a, as a church, that's going to be the thing that will win people over. Well, Jesus did a great deal of good work in Capernaum. In fact, the people were amazed at his words and his deeds. But I don't think it produced repentance and faith in their lives. Because later on in Luke chapter 10, Jesus would actually speak a word of judgment against Capernaum because of their failure to repent. Now, please don't hear me saying that these things like well-reasoned arguments or able preachers or spiritual experience or good... Don't hear me saying that those things are bad things. They're not. They're not. They're not illegitimate in the ministry of the gospel. In fact, we want to have those things. But what I am saying is that God's primary appointed means of reaching this world, of reaching your neighbourhood that is spiritually dead and under his judgment, is the proclamation of God's word. That is how God was at work there in Capernaum, and that is how God continues to do his work in our world today. So that's the first point of our sermon today, the power of Jesus' words. The second and final point of our sermon today is um, the priority of Jesus' words. Now, imagine for a moment that you're Jesus' manager, okay? You've been there for that, with that whole day at Capernaum and uh, you're responsible trying to help advance the mission. And given the huge success in Capernaum, surely the smart move is to capitalise on this momentum in Capernaum. Maybe the next stop would be to try and secure for Jesus a gig at Jerusalem General Hospital, Try and get the media to come along and, and interview those who are going to be healed by Jesus' powerful word. Who knows? Maybe even the ABC might give it some airtime. But look at what Jesus does in verses 42 to 44. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said... I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Now, I'm sure that if any of us were living in Capernaum that, uh, that day, uh, it's hardly surprising that they wanted Jesus to stay. Uh, they've had a glimpse of the future of the kingdom of God where God puts everything right. They are nothing like the residents of Jesus' hometown in Nazareth. But Jesus has a bigger agenda than his own personal popularity. 
Jesus has got a bigger agenda than the short-term fix of this town's physical and social problems. Jesus is determined to fulfil his mission. I mean, just look at how Jesus says it so forcefully there in verse 43. I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because that is why I was sent. Above all else, Jesus has come into this world to announce the good news of the kingdom of God. And he is even prepared to neglect the social and physical needs of Capernaum so that he can focus his attention on announcing the good news of the kingdom of God. You might say that Jesus is in prioritising the important over the urgent. The urgent are the physical and social problems in Capernaum. They're always urgent. But Jesus understands what's important. And so he sets out to preach in the synagogues of Judea. And it seems to me that the priority that Jesus places on speaking the word of God should be held as the standard by which we assess the values of any sort of ministry in the local church. It's simply asking the question, is our agenda the same as Jesus' agenda? Now, hopefully, some of those ministries are obvious to us from the informal conversation that you might have with somebody at morning tea time where you bring God's word to bear on a particular situation. That's speaking God's word, isn't it? Or our small group ministry where a small group of people gather week by week to read God's word together and seek to understand it. Or as we meet together for our public meetings week by week where God's word is preached. Hopefully we're on the same page with Jesus, that his priority is our priority. But it can also assess the value of those ministries that don't directly speak God's word. For example, the church cleaning roster. Okay? Church cleaning roster. Now, there, as far as I know, there is no spoken word ministry uh, when somebody's in here vacuuming this church and cleaning out the pews. But it is a really important ministry amongst us, isn't it? Because it helps the ministry of the word, because we like sitting in a clean and tidy building. It helps us to listen to the ministry of God's word. We don't want to be sitting in a dump. So that we can assess that ministry in the light of how it contributes to the ministry of the word. That's true for our Fresh Food Tuesday. That'll be starting up in February. Now, that's a good thing for us to do, to be helping to provide uh, fresh food and vegetables to our local community, but it's also the opportunity it provides us to speak to people, to engage with them, and ho hopefully get the opportunities to speak God's word to them. Uh, this week, I read about a provocative letter that was uh, published in uh, uh, a, a magazine called The British Weekly, and uh, this is what it said. Dear Sir, it seems that ministers feel that their sermons are very important and spend a great deal of time preparing them. I've been attending church quite regularly for 30 years and I have probably heard 3,000 of them. To my consternation, I discovered I cannot remember a single sermon. I wonder if a minister's time might be more profitably spent on something else. Classic British understatement, isn't it? Now, for weeks, that letter produced a storm of editorial responses. Uh, but that letter gave voice to the general low opinion of preaching. And you know what? I sort of get what this person's saying. I sort of agree with it. I mean, this week, I checked out who was preaching January last year. And I was rostered on to preach on the 22nd of January last year. And you know what? I couldn't remember what I preached on. I couldn't remember. Now, maybe it's because I've got a poor memory or it's simply that what I preached wasn't memorable. Uh, just out of curiosity, can anyone here remember what I preached on on the 22nd of January last year? Come on, anyone? No one? No, that's a fudge there. 
I, I, I had to look it up on the preaching roster. I was preaching on Luke chapter 9, verses 51 to 62, about Jesus who demands our first allegiance. That's what I preached on the 22nd of last year. But it does raise the question, why bother with the ministry of the word? Just because it's Jesus' priority? Uh, there was a response that was uh, written to the British Weekly that finally ended the, uh, the letters to the editor, and this is what it said. Dear Sir, I've been married for 30 years. During that time, I've eaten 32,850 meals, mostly by my wife's cooking. Suddenly, I've discovered I cannot remember the menu of a single meal, and yet, I have the distinct impression that without them, I would have starved to death long ago. <laughs> J.C. Ryle, the 19th century Bishop of Liverpool in England, cautioned us against um, despising the ministry of God's word because it is the ministry of God's word that awakens the sinner and edifies the saints. So let me make two brief points in conclusion and I hope you'll be able to remember them by the end of today. Firstly, if we have a Messiah whose priority is to speak the good news of the Kingdom of God, then it is our priority to listen. Okay? If, it, if his priority is to speak, it is our priority to listen. In Luke chapter 9, it records the transfiguration of Jesus on the mountain where Peter, James and John heard the voice from heaven say, This is my Son whom I have chosen Listen to him. But it's not the, it is the sort of listening that results in change. Jesus would go on and say in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? You see, listening to the word of Jesus and doing what he says is what it means to be one of his disciples. That's the first thing, priority to listen. Second is the priority to tell others about the good news of the kingdom of God. Jesus has ascended into heaven and where he rules from on high and it is now our job to tell others. Jesus isn't here on earth to do it, but we have been left God's word in the Bible and it's now our job uh, to tell others. And Jesus said as much in Luke chapter 24, verses 46 to 47, where he says, and he told them, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Now friends, this is not the responsibility of the few. This is the privilege that has been passed on to every single Christian person who calls Jesus their Saviour and their Lord. It doesn't always mean rising to a pulpit and speaking God's word as I do, but in the ordinary daily conversations that you find yourself in, there's opportunities to speak it there, to be involved in the ministries that happen here at St Luke's. And it will not be easy, in the same way that it wasn't easy for Jesus, but we can have confidence because his word has power and authority to save. So let's listen to him and align ourselves to his priority of speaking God's word to this world. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we do thank and praise you that you sent your Son, in, our Saviour, into the world to announce the good news of the kingdom of God. Thank you for his commitment to that end and for his powerful word to save others. Heavenly Father, we pray that we might indeed be a people who not only listen to Jesus' word, but to do what it says. And that we might indeed take up the responsibility that you have placed upon all of us to speak that word to this unbelieving world so that they too might come to know salvation in Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.